uh, sarcoidosis. So I'm going to briefly talk about some of these disease and just diseases and orient you all um, to these connective tissue diseases. The ILD, because we're short on time, I'm just going to not define this again, because I think you all have had this uh, several times. So basically, we're talking about this subset of diseases right here, the connective tissue associated ILD. So as you can see with the ILD, there's all different types, and we've just heard about the exposures and occupational exposures. There's idiopathic ILD, which is probably makes up the most of ILD, and then we're focusing right here on the connective tissue um, and autoimmune disease associated ILD. I did want to just Briefly mention, though, that although we, we estimate about 13% of all ILD is connective tissue disease related, there is this emerging idea of an interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features, or IPAF, where patients are having feature, some features of an autoimmune disease, but they don't fully meet criteria for a specific connective tissue disease. Yet, you know, the, the idea is that there's something related to their immune system that's causing the lung fibrosis. So just in very broad terms, again, I'm talking about a bunch of different diseases and lumping them all together under connective tissue disease. But what I want to emphasize is that what's really important for us as the rheumatologist, so that's the doctor who takes care of people with autoimmune diseases, is to be really good detectives. So we have to actually talk with the patient, which is so sad how, how little that gets done <coughs> these days. But talk with the patient, listen to them, and as Osler said, when you listen to your patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. So it's all there in the history and in the physical exam for many times when we're um, seeing patients with connective tissue disease. But, um, so that's an important part of this. And then managing um, patients can, with this condition can range from just watching and observing and monitoring over the years or to actually treating them what are, with what are called immune suppressive therapy or drugs that suppress the immune system, suppress the inflammation so that there's no damage. Um, and common presenting features, and this is with all ILD, and maybe it's been talked about already, cough, progressive shortness of breath, and on physical exam, when we're listening to your lungs with a stethoscope, we can hear crackles at the bases. So, and it exactly sounds like crackles going on at the bases of the lungs. So let's move gears into scleroderma. So scleroderma makes up probably the largest proportion of connective tissue disease associated ILD that's clinically significant. So probably more people have rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD, but clinically significant disease is probably scleroderma. Scleroderma, if you're Googling it online, is also sometimes referred to as systemic sclerosis. Uh, it's a disease that's predominantly in women between the ages of 30 and 50, so this is a, a disease of younger people. Um, and about 20, 10 to 25% of all patients with scleroderma will have some pulmonary symptoms. But they did a case where they looked at autopsies of 100 uh, of patients with systemic sclerosis, and although only 25% of them may have been symptomatic, 100% of them actually had changes in their lungs. So we know something's going on there. The question is, you know, when does it become clinically significant, or when do the doctors or the patients feel that the, this effect is going on in their lungs? And there are two types of scleroderma. There's a limited, which is also called Crest syndrome. And I'm throwing out these terms because you might come across them when you're reading about this area, or a diffuse scleroderma. These are some pictures of um, some of the features associated with scleroderma. So this is called Raynaud's, and it's where you have vasospasm or spasming of the small blood vessels in the tips of the fingers. Scleroderma is basically excessive production of collagen. That's the connective tissue that's involved with scleroderma. And it can affect the skin. And you can see here, sclera means thickening in derma is skin. So you can see that the fingers can get very thickened. And this is called sclerodactyly. And this is a common feature that we can see in patients with scleroderma. They can get problems with their esophagus. They can develop calcium deposits under the skin. And here we're showing these small little um, dilated blood vessels on the fingers called telangiectasia. So these are all little clues that we're looking for when we're seeing a patient who might have scleroderma. And as far as the pulmonary manifestations, um, it affects the lungs in multiple ways. We are mostly talking about ILD today, but there's also a disease called pulmonary hypertension, which many of you may have heard of. And pulmonary hypertension is when you have high blood pressure in the pulmonary artery. So everybody's heard of high blood pressure, and that's blood pressure that when you take over here on your arm, and that's your systemic blood pressure. But folks with scleroderma can often develop 
elevated blood pressures in that main artery that leaves the heart and goes to the lungs. That's called pulmonary hypertension. And that actually um, can also be a very, very serious condition. And patients can have pulmonary hypertension along with um, the um, ILD. But we're only going to talk about the ILD today. And um, like I said, it's the most common form of connective tissue disease-associated ILD. It's more common in patients who have the diffuse form of scleroderma than the limited form. And we, as rheumatologists, since we're generally seeing these patients in our clinic and we share them with the pulmonologist, we're often, um, and if, if you're a patient that has a connective tissue disease or has scleroderma, we should, you, your rheumatologist should be getting yearly pulmonary function tests. That's the recommendation, yearly echocardiograms. We get, you know, sometimes get the six-minute walking test. As far as the high-resolution CT scan, CT scanning, and I know radiologist is going to be speaking to you all, has been, a, a, has been really helpful in us understanding different types of interstitial lung disease. But it's not a screening tool. So once our suspicion is high enough that something could be going on, then we'll order a CT scan. But there's a lot of radiation with CT scans, and so we don't want to be exposing patients to that. Um, what we ideally are hoping for is a biomarker. We could test your blood and we could find something in there that would tell us that you're having these, th this going on in your lungs. We are not there yet. Um, so in terms of treatments, steroids, steroids are rheumatologists and sometimes the pulmonologist's best friend and worst enemy. We love them and we hate them at the same time. And the reason for that is there's so many bad side effects with steroids. But for many of you who have been on steroids, you probably also realize how quickly they work and how quickly they make the breathing feel better. So in, in scleroderma, though, you have to be very, very cautious with the use of steroids because high doses of steroids can lead to a very rare complication of scleroderma called scleroderma renal crisis. But, um, so in, in scleroderma lung, we don't use as much of the high doses of steroids as we do in some of the other connective tissue-associated ILDs. Um, the other therapy that you may have come across or heard about is cyclophosphamide or cytoxan. And this is what we call our big gun. It's a chemotherapy drug. Um, it has a lot of uh, significant toxicity. It can be given as a pill or through an IV in, a month, in an infusion. And um, there have been, in, in, as far as actual data and good randomized clinical trials in this area, there have not been a lot. But in scleroderma, we have several trials. They've been called the scleroderma um, lung studies. And the first one basically said cytoxin is better than doing nothing. OK, thanks. That's helpful. It's, it's better than nothing. So that was good until we were using it. But then so many bad side effects. And so we start, there was the second study done, the scleroderma lung study two, where we looked at a, a, a drug that we're going to talk about next, mycophenolate mofetil, or Cellcept. Um, and found that it was actually equivalent to cytoxin, that it was better tolerated. Patients could be on it longer, and they tolerated it be better and had less side effect and didn't have a progression of their lung disease. So again, mycophenolate mofetil or Cellcept, very well tolerated. Um, people who've been on it know that it can cause a lot of GI upset, diarrhea. That can be very serious and impairing. But for the most part, when you compare it to some of the other drugs, it is tolerated pretty well. And it's associated with stabilization and lung function and can be a longer term option. <coughs> so the next disease I wanted to talk about was rheumatoid arthritis. And in rheumatology, rheumatoid arthritis is the most common disease that we see. And um, it's a chronic systemic inflammatory syndrome that primarily affects the joints, the small joints of the fingers and the feet. And, but it can have systemic effects and, and, and affect the, the um, lungs. Uh, primarily by developing nodules in the lungs. You can also see a dr like some of the drugs that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis could cause toxicity in the lungs. Um, and then also it can just independently cause an RA-associated ILD. And risk factors for developing that are patients who have nodular um, rheumatoid arthritis, if you're a smoker, and if you have what's called a CCP antibody that's positive, that predisposes you to having a higher likelihood of developing RAILD and you know, more than just the joints. So it's very complex to manage these patients. And Dr. Case and I have had cases where we go back and forth and you're just, you know, we're trying to treat the patient's joint pain, and yet some of those medicines we use to treat their joints don't really help their lungs, and then the medicines that help their lungs don't help their joints, and, we're, and they're all are suppressing the immune system. So we're, we're really you know, struggling here, and, and it works as a team effort to try to make sure we can come up with the right drug at that right time to help treat whatever problem is the, the bigger one of the, of the two. 
And um, like I said, some of these medicines we use to treat the joints can affect the lungs negatively. Um, other medications that are on the market right now, we're still trying to understand their role in, in ILD, but the TNF inhibitors, the biologics, those are the ones that are all advertised on TV, and you all have seen them on TV, Enbrel, Humira, all that stuff. Um, we still don't really know what they do for the lungs. We know they're very effective for the joints, still trying to understand their role in um, lung disease. The next disease I wanted to talk about was myositis, and myo is muscle, and itis is inflammation, so inflammation of the muscles. And uh, there's different types of um, these types of myositis. So polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and um, a subset of these called anti-sympathase syndrome, which is a newer entity that we've, that's been identified. And there's special blood tests you can do to identify if you fall into that small subgroup. And patients with anti-sympathase anti syndrome will have, unfortunately, sometimes a more progressive pulmonary component to their disease. And so that's something we, we now have antibodies that we can, blood tests that we can check and put you in that category and understand what's going on. Some comical, common um, findings on physical exam may be mechanics hands. So that's when, you know, you, you're not a mechanic, but your hands look dry and flaky and, and, and cut and it can be very subtle. Um, Gottron's papules, which are these plaques on the back side of your hands over your knuckles. And these is a heliotropic rash. That one's a little more obvious around the eyes. Not very common, though. All right. And so with this, um, when you have ILD associated with myositis, we do generally use pretty high doses of steroids. Um, pulse steroids is what it's called. So through the IV, high doses. Cellcept is still usually the first-line therapy, the mycophenolate mofetil, the drug we just talked about for scleroderma. And then rituxan um, is another drug that... Um, sometimes is used a little more when patients have myositis-associated ILD because um, it helps with the muscle disease as well. Since we're trying to treat, remember, these are multi-system diseases, so we're trying to treat all the, just very quickly, just so you've heard it, um, other, you know, connective tissue diseases associated with ILD. So Sjogren's syndrome is a dry eyes, dry mouth syndrome. Um, that can have a, a pulmonary component to it or a lung component. Uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, also called SLE, also called lupus, just lupus. Um, it's an autoimmune disease that affects multiple systems, so the lungs. It can affect the actual lung parenchyma, the lung tissue. It can affect the lining of the lungs, um, kidneys, skin, joints. Um, and then mixed connective tissue disease is this other entity that has features of multiple of these um, autoimmune diseases in one disease, and they can get in the lung component. And then sarcoidosis, we, don't talk, we didn't talk a lot about that, but um, it, it's also kind of a multi-system autoimmune disease, and sarcoid tends to be very, very steroid responsive. Um, in terms of other treatments, um, uh, these are just some other drugs that you may come across, azathioprine or imuran, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, and then the rituxan, which we just talked about as being other treatments. All right. So stuff on the horizon. So what are some other possibilities of ways of treating patients with um, connective tissue disease associated ILD? So stem cell transplantation um, is uh, a, a, a treatment that is now is, is being studied. And um, I, before I was at Piedmont, I was at Duke, and Duke was one of the centers for the Scott trial, which is, um, was a randomized clinical trial where patients with scleroderma were given stem cell transplants. So stem cells, as you guys may or may not know, are cells that are taken out of the, of the body and they're pluripotent. They can change and become different things. So we take some cells and then we give patients medication to suppress their immune system and then we give them the cells back, hoping that when we give them back, they're gonna reset the system and help that autoimmune process from, um, from going on. And we, we use that in a lot of cancer therapy it's, it's, a, it's a new thing to try to use it for autoimmune disease, but scleroderma in severe cases where the skin is progressively changing at a quick rate, that's what the diffuse scleroderma or, they're having, or patients are having progressive lung disease, um, it, it's been used. So in this trial, they basically found that when they put these patients through the stem cell transplants, it definitely improved their skin. Um, and I saw some patients who, who were treated with the stem cell transplant, and it was incredible how it reversed things. Um, but the, and, and the events of free survival was also very, very good. The problem is that these patients had a lot of bad side effects, and they were serious side effects. 
so you know it's it's you have to really pick which patient would be the right patient to undergo such a severe and intense treatment and make sure that they were just at that right place to be able to handle it to be able to go through a whole stem cell transplant so other things are lung transplantation um, it's not done as often for connective tissue disease associated ILD um, as it is with other forms of ILD, but it has been performed in patients successfully with scleroderma, but there are limited centers that do that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to talk about, um, so we talked about scleroderma lung study one and two, and the third scleroderma lung study is uh, underway. And what that is is looking at um, patients with scleroderma-related ILD and using a combination of the mycophenolate mofetil, the cell sept, which we said is kind of a standard right now in what people are using, and combining it with pyrifenidone, which is one of these new antifibrotic agents. And I don't know if that's been spoken about yet today or will be spoken about, but these newer drugs that are used for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, and, and can be possibly maybe they'd have a role in these patients. We just don't know yet if, if it's if it's going to be something that's going to help. But there's a study looking at that. All right, so <coughs> final thoughts. Um, you know, connective tissue disease associated ILD is an area where um, there has to be a lot of collaboration between the pulmonologist and the rheumatologist. And we've been working here at Piedmont to try to see how we can um, improve the way we do things and um, take better care of patients who have a connective tissue disease and have ILD. Um, there are a lot of patients who might have radiographic or x-ray or CT evidence of some changes in their lungs, but don't necessarily need to be treated just yet. And so close monitoring and following patients is important. Um, I just wanted all of you to understand that there are these, there's going to be this gray area. Some folks who have symptoms that might sound like a connective tissue disease, but don't fully meet a criteria. And that's where we're kind of struggling on which way to, which to treat them. But we're, we're learning a lot more about this area. And finally, that we still have a lot of work that needs to be done to identify treatments that would be really, really effective but have the minimal side effects. And that's really what we're working towards. But um, we've definitely made a lot of progress. There's a lot of research being done in this area. It's very, very exciting um, that we can help people in ways that we couldn't um, you know, even 10 or 15 years ago, OK? That's it. Are we doing questions now? Questions now? Questions? One or two? OK, one or two, I've been told. Yes? Not associated with lung disease. No worries. Any other questions? What was that question? Oh, she was asking, is polymyalgia rheumatica associated with lung disease? And it's not. PMR, it's also called. It's a very common condition. Affects proximal shoulders and hips. Very steroid responsive. Not believed to be as systemic, though. No worries. Any other questions? Thank you all for your attention. All right. Um, so we're going to um, move into our demonstration of multidisciplinary discussion. Um, this is a, um, a diagnostic um, way we look at the diagnosis of some of these uh, inter interstitial lung diseases. Um, it's going to take us up until lunch. So we'll one with that. And we, um, so I'm going to ask uh, my multidisciplinary colleague to come up. Judy Chesmar is uh, from Piedmont Radiology. She participates frequently in our con uh, clinical care conferences. And uh, Tamela Snyder is one of our pathologists, and she's been uh, helping us focus on, um, on uh, this uh, type of interaction as well. Um, and ladies, I'm going to cut one of, the, um, one of the cases. I'll just tell you which one it is. It's the middle one. Will it work? Will this work? 
and just click right click and click show and then they should be or actually, if you leave it there, okay. can you can you work on this one, and then we can switch the screens, and I can go ahead and get started with the case. There's so many technical difficulties today. Very. Can you hear me on the recording? Oh, you're already using that now. For the discussion. Right? Perfect. Everything's been good on my end. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize no, it's this. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so can you stand right up? So when we're doing this in clinical care, uh, we get together in a room for a screen, and we all look at the same things at the same time. Um, the, it keeps us from uh, trying to interpret in, interpret information in a vacuum. Um, the uh, the radiologist knows what the clinician is seeing, and the pathologist knows what they're looking at. So, um, so it's very helpful uh, to get back and forth a little bit. We um, I showed my disclosures earlier, but um, <coughs> employees don't have any uh, specifically. So this is this part of the algorithm here, the multidisciplinary discussion. Um, when you've got information to try and put together and piece together the, the puzzle that tends to be interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so uh, so yeah, as you're, I think, coming to understand, if you didn't already, these diseases can be pretty complex. And there is no single diagnostic test that will give an answer. As my mentor used to tell me, it's not like cancer where you get a biopsy and the cancer is on the biopsy and then that's what you have, right? Um, this is uh, multiple types of diseases can lead to the same patterns uh, and multiple clinical presentations can then lead to different patterns of disease. So, um, so all of these things are important. And uh, sometimes the tests don't always quite correlate together, so you have to know uh, what weight to put on um, some of the different things that we're seeing. And so um, our multidisciplinary team, our core team really consists of pulmonologists, radiologists, and pathologists, but we frequently have input from uh, our rheumatology colleagues, uh, nurse specialists, and then um, other members of that team can be very important too. So I'll go ahead and tell you that this, uh, this this, uh, these images could be seen in a uh, maybe a 74-year-old male who was short of breath, right? Makes you think of perhaps idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It could also be seen in a 33-year-old female with rheumatoid arthritis, and that's something completely different, right? Um, a pattern of involvement is the same. The underlying disease process is somehow different, and what we end up doing with that, at least for the time being, is a little different too. <coughs> Also different if you got somebody who keeps 12 parakeets in their in their bedroom. <coughs> Maybe that's something that's important, um, and management of that would be different too. Um, so for, I think we're ready. Is this for cases? Um, we're we're going to have some interpretive dance when it comes to the pathology portion of this show. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see what it looks like because we'll just uh, dance it out. Well, I'm going to give a little case history, and then we'll put the switch over to the PACs. So, um, so just to start with, I'll tell you about um, one patient. Uh, so a gentleman who came with no prior history of lung disease, had a relatively abrupt onset, pretty severe shortness of breath, and, um, and some cough. But I'll tell you, this, this gentleman had been, uh, when his symptoms started, had been out of town, uh, overseas on vacation was totally fine walked miles and miles he said I uh, came back and then shortly after coming back home started with this uh, these symptoms lots of cough sometimes with mucus production sometimes not but was really short of breath had some reflux just in the background been not a problem for him um, and saw his primary care and then a pulmonologist and they tried some stuff some inhalers multiple inhalers um, some steroids, and, uh, and I think he had two rounds of antibiotics in, in not a very long period of time. Nothing really helped. Um, so, uh, so after all this, he got popped in the hospital um, and uh, had, uh, 
bronchoscopy procedure that was non-diagnostic, so, so looking for infection, looking for things that we can diagnose on bronchoscopy, didn't really find anything that was helpful, um, but was discharged with some home oxygen. Made him feel better, but mm, what's going on? Why is he, why is his, uh, oxygen, why is oxygen levels low? Um, turns out he smoked, but not for very long and quit a long time ago. Um, did primarily office work. Um, and his home was newer and didn't have any pets in it. Um, but, uh, but by the time he can, came to see me, he had had a similar phenomenon where he'd gone out of town for, um, for a long weekend, felt better. We didn't have number data or anything. But when he came back, he started feeling bad again. On exam, uh, he had these uh, inspiratory crackles on the base of his lungs. He didn't have any digital clubbing, and he didn't have any evidence of any autoimmune disease, uh, no joint findings, no skin findings, anything like that. Um, he was, I'll tell you, coughing so much that despite his best efforts, we really couldn't get any um, good numbers on him for MPFTs when he first came in, which is totally understandable, and let me tell you, he worked hard. Um, but when he walked, he, um, his oxygen levels dropped. Uh, when he started walking in the hallways, they were okay when he was just sitting, but when he'd get up and start to move around, and he needed four liters of oxygen um, to maintain his oxygen levels at the place where they, we felt comfortable with um, when he was just walking around our office. So we, um, we did have some, uh, some blood tests, uh, some, <coughs> some serology to look for autoimmune disease. All of those were negative. We felt like they probably would be on the basis of his uh, exam in history, but um, go check them anyways for thoroughness. And then he did have a hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, panel, which here has uh, six different things on it. You know, there's a lot of stuff on that list. We can test for a few of them. All of that was negative. Um, and I think as you heard Dr. Lockhart say, it's sometimes useful and sometimes not. Can we pop up? All right, so I'm going to have, uh, oops, let me get this off for a second. And we'll, we'll show the imaging. It's, it's um, interesting. I will make that bigger. Is that okay? I'll give you this. Thanks, Amy. Since we have a. Um, uh, Thank you. Right here. Ah, thanks. A mixed audience. I, I want to show a normal first because I think that's a, a way we can better appreciate um, the findings in our patients. So this is a normal. We, scalp image from um, a CT scan, and you can see these lungs are nicely expanded. And when we look at the axial images, so these are the images just cross-sectionally through the chest, uh, you see the normal lungs at CT. So all this black is the air-containing lungs, the white is the blood vessels, and the lung parenchyma looks homogeneous. It's about the same density all the way to the periphery of the lung. So with that in mind, Let's look at our patient. different this looks from our previous normal. <coughs> so in this case, this is what the radiologists call the lung volumes are reduced. They're not as well expanded. And you can see even on this scalp that these lungs look much busier. There's something else going on in the lung. So if we go to our axial images, which will load slowly, the first question for the radiologist in a case like this is, is there fibrosis present? So the radiologist goes through the images to look for the signs of fibrosis. And in this case, the answer is yes. And what are the signs that we look for? Well, if you remember um, in the previous case, the lungs look black all the way to the subpleural lung, to the periphery. And here you see all this white stuff, these little reticular lines, these little nest-like things. That's irregular subpleural reticulation. And that's abnormal, and that's 
UIP pattern. It has a regular subplural articulation, it has traction bronchiectasis, it has honeycombing, um, but it hasn't ensured that this patient has a feature that's inconsistent with UIP pattern. All of this, you see how the lung parenchyma is different in attenuation here? All of this white stuff is ground glass opacity. Significant ground glass opacity then, the radiologist puts this out of the UIP pattern. This patient has features inconsistent with the UIP pattern. So the next question is, well, what is this? What, um, what, you know, what happens when we see fibrosis that you think has features of the UIP pattern but has one feature inconsistent with the UIP pattern? The next thing you ask is, well, where is that ground glass opacity? Distribution of the abnormality is really important on the CT. And in this case, I think you can see that it's upper lung predominant. So now what we try to do in conjunction with the information that the, the, the pulmonologist has provided us is figure out what the differential diagnosis is. What could this possibly be? And really, the fact that the symptoms waxed and waned, went away when you went away from home, returned when you came back, suggests that the that with the presence of fibrosis suggests that this is something that this has been going on for a long time. There's some chronic element of it, there's fibrosis, but there's also this ground glass opacity, <coughs> upper low predominance superimposed on the fibrotic pattern. So the leading differential um, in this case would be chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And really that's you know ground glass opacity superimposed on um, the chronic fibrotic pattern really leads the radiologist to that diagnosis. So this patient has a lung biopsy, which I'm hoping we can see. Unfortunately, Piedmont is very safe when it comes to technology. <laughs> We're so safe that we can't see the pathology images. So in real life, what we would do is we would have the slides, and they would be on a microscope that projects on a screen. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that in this room because we're outside the pathology lab, and um, and our pictures are encrypted. Right? Don't get a USB drive and stick it in a computer here because it won't work. Um, and the files are, are large. So, um, Tamla, could you maybe just describe sort of what you saw and what those findings mean? Similar to what Dr. Chesmar just said, pathologists also like to look for patterns. So the first thing um, we like to look at when we're looking at a slide is determine, okay, low power view, what's going on here from your low power view? And so in this particular case, um, there was interstitial fibrosis involving the interstitium. Sometimes we have um, elements that are involving the airways, but in this particular one, it was involving the interstitium. And in order to have a diagnosis of UIP in pathology, there are also certain criteria that you have to look for. So UIP has been described as a patchwork type of phenomenon, meaning that it looks different from dif different um, areas of the lung. So there's temporal heterogeneity. So this looks different from this, this, looks, this part looks diff different from another part. So, in this particular case, it's hard for me to describe without the, without the images, but in this particular case, um, what we saw were some areas that had scarring. So that is what's, what a pathologist thinks of as fibrosis that has been ongoing for a long time, a chronic problem, a long-term problem. But there were also areas that had fibroblastic foci, which is more of a, um, something that we see when there has been recent fibrosis. There was also honeycomb change, something that we also think of when there has been an element of chronicity and the lungs are, are no longer have their normal airways, but they have become more like cystically dilated spaces and someone sort of likened it to a honeycomb. And so under the microscope, it sort of looks like um, a honeycomb and it's called honeycomb change. So, we have fibrosis that looks different in different areas, and, but there were also some 
Um, sort of give me more of a honeycomb type of um, appearance or, um, yeah, so here we go. You, you guys have probably are, saw this earlier, I, I, I seen this morning. So we have here the honeycomb of appearance or, or multiple sort of back-to-back -back cysts. So normally here you would have airways that look like this, but when you have honeycomb and your airways are destroyed and they become just sort of these dilated cystic spaces that are filled with mucin. So that's our honeycomb change. And our fibroblastic foci are areas that look like this, where it's recently, um, something has recently attacked the airways, and it's, this is an early sign of healing. Um, so the combination of honeycomb change, fibroblastic foci, um, bronchiolar metaplasia, which was another thing that we often look for, um, gives us a UIP pattern. But it didn't end here for this patient. So there's a UIP pattern. But there were also, in some areas, um, these poorly formed granulomas. And not really, yeah, not really showing here. But um, a granuloma is kind of a, a small um, sort of nodular proliferation of histiocytes with some multinucleated giant cells. Sometimes they have foreign material associated with them. Sometimes they can be really tight and nodular and well circumscribed, as in you would see with sarcoid. But in this case, they were very loose, but poorly formed. And that is something that we often see with hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So this ca case was ultimately signed out as UIP pattern um, with all the components of UIP, most suggestive of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So, uh, so I'll give you some follow-up on this patient. He was, uh, well, ultimately we came to the diagnosis um, that, that had this sort of environmental flavor to it, but we never could identify what was going on in his environment. So he actually did decide to pack up and move, um, which a lot of people don't have resources to do. Um, but he did, and when they were getting, uh, he and his wife were getting their house ready to sell, they pulled up the carpet, and underneath it was a ton of yucky, gross mold, and it had been under there the whole time. And he moved out, and he did have sort of fibrotic um, uh, background to his disease, but um, seemed to have stabilized outside of the environment. So good, good for him. Um, we'll, uh, we're gonna, since we have short time uh, and have so much uh, difficulty with our tech today, um, we're gonna move on to our next case. Uh, and I'm. Uh, <coughs> um, so this is a, so change gears. This is a young patient actually presented with a spontaneous pneumothorax, 35 year old male. Um, he presented uh, to the emergency room. He was at work and had a uh, acute abrupt onset of chest pain with shortness of breath, and he had a chest X-ray showing that he had a lung collapse um, on one side. Um, so in the emergency room, uh, he had a chest tube placed. Um, and uh, some imaging was obtained and some other things were done. Um, he was a smoker, he smoked a pack a day, um, had been smoking for about uh, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 years, 35, committed to it there, um, and worked in the service in industry. Um, he was, uh, I think he was waiting tables at the time, had done some other stuff, but that was kind of primarily it. Um, on exam, uh, this is, <coughs> kidding, that exam is not uh, what it was. I did this while I was watching hurricane coverage, so I was very distracted. It's a different exam. So he actually had absence of, uh, in his initial presentation, his lungs were pretty clear, but he had absence of breath sounds in part of the, um, the affected lung. And 
Um, and you did ultimately have some uh, serolo serologic testing while it was under healing. All right, and this is the third case. So if you want to switch, we will. We'll show his imaging, but he did, um, on the basis of this, end up having surgery. Uh, part of the surgery was intended to prevent future spontaneous collapses in the lung. Uh, we call it pleurodesis, and that's just to sort of tack the lung to the chest wall so that didn't happen again. Um, and, and while the surgeon was already had the chest open, I got some uh, lung biopsy um, material as well for further information on the basis of what we saw on the um, CT scan. I could do a tap dance for you guys. Or, I didn't wear my tap shoes, sorry. So I'll do some housekeeping. I don't want to do that while, uh, while we're looking for this. Um, we're going to break for lunch after this case is over. Um, lunch will be out that way. There will be people to point you that direction. Please wear your wristband um, so that we don't have interlopers trying to take lunch. Okay. Um, the, uh, so show your wristband when you go pick up your lunch. Uh, there will also be people to direct you to the next session. Um, so there are a lot of people to get through the line. So you may want to start thinking about where you're going to go next. Yeah, we got this. I got that part. Um, where you're going to go next on the basis of what's on your sticker, on your uh, name tag. And there will be people to help direct you to those places too. Um, one of those sessions will be back in here. Uh, we'll have sessions in some of the classrooms. And then uh, um, the session with uh, Procon debate with pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease is uh, we're um, going to have the health care providers for that one. Hopefully you guys have already know that. That's going to be upstairs so people who have, have um, trouble getting around are not going to have to go up that direction. Um, so I think that's my housekeeping. Uh, we already told you about getting your parking tags. And now Julie can show you the picture. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. So this is a case where you don't need to be a radiologist to know there's something wrong. So this is the patient's chest tube. You can still see some air around the lungs. So this patient has a pneumothorax that's been treated. But when we look at the axial injuries through the chest, this is clearly abnormal. Instead of this normal looking lung parenchyma extending out to the periphery, you see these big cystic spaces. Um, so these are large subfloral bullets. When we see this, especially with the smoking history, we want to look for additional signs that perhaps something else is going on here besides this paraseptal emphysema. These are single layer, large, variable size cystic spaces. So this is the CT finding of paraseptal emphysema. Um, particularly, we want to look for signs of other smoking-related diseases. And while the lung parenchyma here looks a little bit more hazy than that normal, um, I don't see any discrete nodule. There's no destructive process in the central portion of the lung, so there's no associated central lobular emphysema. Um, <coughs> there's definite um, paraseptal emphysema, and again, here's the air in the pleural space, the large pneumothorax. Okay, so as I said, um, the hospital team managing this patient and saw all this knew he was going to get, uh, I was at high risk for having the lung collapse again on the basis of all that emphysema in the lung. Um, and so I went ahead and asked a surgeon to sort of tap that lung so it wouldn't happen again. And while he was there, he wanted to investigate further the abnormalities, and so I got some lung biopsy tissue. Um, Maybe I gotta do that. Nope. So we're back to interpretive dance, I suppose. <laughs> okay. So, um, like I said earlier about patterns, 
Um, we like to look for patterns. So in, in this particular case, the pattern was more of an airspace involvement um, as opposed to an interstitial involvement. So what we saw in this patient's lung biopsies, the air spaces or you know, the, the areas where the lung usually goes and glass, gases are exchanged were full of pigment-laden macrophages, or sometimes people call them smoker's macrophages. And um, we don't always, I mean, it's associated usually with smokers. You can see them um, in some other um, situations, but it's commonly associated with smokers. Um, there was not a um, significant amount of fibrosis, but in a patient who was clinically symptomatic and has radiographic findings, the pathologic diagnosis, here we go. So you can see here, um, so normally these air spaces are completely empty in a, in a normal lung, but I don't know if the ground is, is really pro projecting nicely here, but um, these are all filled with pigment-laden macrophages. Um, which um, anthropotic pigment, pigment that we often associate with smokers. And you can see that the um, alveolar lining um, here is actually really thin. It's not thickened. There's really not a whole lot of interstitial um, pathology going on here. It's mostly just an airspace problem. Um, and in addition to the, this, we also saw um, what Dr. Chesmar showed. We saw the pathology correlate of that, which was um, extensive bullous disease, which was mostly located in the subpleural areas. So a combination of respiratory bronchiolitis, associated interstitial lung disease, and bullous emphysema. So uh, in kind of an unsatisfying manner, this gentleman um, uh, once his uh, lung collapse was resolved, uh, wasn't very symptomatic anymore, um, and so decided it wasn't very important to quit smoking or follow up. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, to date, uh, is uh, is lost to follow up. You guys don't do that, please. Um, but uh, but hopefully, uh, at some point, the message will come across and will quit smoking. Because these changes that we're seeing are driven by that exposure and we think it will have the tendency to progress and get worse uh, if we can't remove that exposure from his, uh, his lung environment. So, um, let me get back here. So because I can't deal with any more techno technological issues, we're just gonna wrap this session up. Um, the take home points here, I think, are that a multidisciplinary interaction is actually strongly recommended for diagnosis in interstitial lung disease. A patient is a lot like a puzzle in this, this situation, and putting all those pieces together um, and getting enough of them together that you can tell what the picture looks like is really important. Um, it improves the accuracy of the diagnosis, and um, all of those features are important. Um, in making an accurate uh, diagnosis for patients. So I'll end with saying a picture is worth a thousand words. I say that a lot. Um, we've, we've seen some pictures today um, that, uh, that do help and help you guys kind of get an idea of what happens when a diagnosis is being made. So.